Hi, all, and thank you for tuning in to today's wonderful event with John Lithgow and Jane Curtin, along with guest appearances from some of John's friends. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 25th year. I want to thank Bookshop.org for partnering with us today. With each book you buy from Bookshop.org, you help an independent bookstore somewhere in this country. So try it. John Lithgow's new book, Trumpy Dumpty Wanted a Crown, gives us a brief history and verse about the players and events of these past four years in a most wonderful way. As if his poems weren't powerful enough, John's drawings provide more comic relief. And who could imagine that Mitch, Barr, Pompeo, and friends could serve as muses to John, our new poet laureate of writer's block? But about those wanton muses, do not despair. There are good guys among us, and John remains fair. It's not all just about the minions of Mitch and how justice might want them pitched in a ditch. I promise you now he won't leave you grouchy. He enshrines our heroes like Nancy Schiff and good Dr. Fauci. Forgive me for that, everybody. But I woke up this and I was <laughs> writing poems for John. This <laughs> is what Trumpy Dumpty does to you when you read this book. We know and love Jane Curtin as part of the original cast of Saturday Night Live. Her acerbic deadpan is the stuff of legend, whether it was her unforgettable weekend update, point counterpoint, or conehead sketches. As you recall, she was John's co-star in Third Rock from the Sun. Before I introduce John and Jane, we have one requirement. Please do not record the clips you'll see in the program today. They're for your eyes only. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce John Lithgow and Jane Curtin. Thank you, Andrea. This is impossible. Your poem was completely impossible to follow. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> you put me to shame. That's um, the addendum to your book, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I get everybody rhyming from this. Uh, I'm, I'm told to, to sort of kick things off a little bit and then introduce my, inter, my splendid interviewer. Uh, this time last year, I was on a book tour for my first book of poems about the Trump administration, Dumpty, the Age of Trump in Verse. I think a year ago, probably to the day, uh, I was being interviewed live in a great big hall by Calvin Trillin up in San Francisco. I was having the most wonderful book tour, showing off to my heart's content, uh, doing book signings where I would read poems and making everybody laugh and stopping the show. Uh, and of course, that was completely out this year. Uh, we had to figure out a completely new way of introducing everybody to my second book, Trumpy Dumpty Wanted a Crown. That's it, by the way, right in the background. You see, that's the kind of thing that other people did for me last year. Uh, <laughs> Well, this writer's block stepped up, invited us to do this, and it's a wonderful way to uh, introduce you all to my book. Uh, and the best news of all is that Jane said, yes, this is our, our first time together, if you can call this together, in years. We've stayed in touch with each other. We've been great, great friends ever since Third Rock from the Sun. A few days ago, I was asked to do a an interview for a documentary, television documentary on the history of the sitcom. And we did a deep dive into those six years when I did Third Rock from the Sun. It, it made me so incredibly in, uh, nostalgic for those six years of out of control laughter. And this woman had a huge lot to do with that. Uh, the most wonderful comedy partner I've ever had. It not, not, if not the, the most acting partner, period. And, uh, and I knew that we would have a wonderful time talking together about my book. So Jane, with that, I'll hand things over to you. Well, thank you so much, John, and good night. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. <laughs> when, I, 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 have I, to, I have to admit that after reading your book, which I just thought was deliciously acerbic and important, and it made me so angry, but it does make you want to rhyme. <laughs> it does. You start thinking in couplets. And it's, well, it's, it turns out 
Turns out it's possible to be angry and to rhyme at the same time. Exactly, exactly. You see, I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is how you're going to sell your book. This is, this is what you do now. Yeah, this well, is... I'm doing a couple of forewarned talk shows too. Yeah. Uh, you know, talk shows you sit in, I sit in this very chair all by myself and I speak to people like Jimmy Fallon and Stephen Colbert sitting alone in their rooms. Things are different now. Uh, but unfortunately, things are more similar than different in the White House, so we have a lot to talk about. I, I, I did, did you hear that, that um, Trump uh, put out his health care plan today? No, I have not heard a thing about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a, uh, I think it was one page. Um, it is a, a uh, presidential edict. It is, it is, um, and everyone who has read it has said, well, this is going to get rid of the whole insurance uh, idea. It's not just getting rid of insurance company, it's getting rid of the idea of insurance. So he's, he's, he's at it again. He's well, at edict, it again. edict is the word. Uh, I mean, it was curiously prescient calling this book Trumpy Dumpty Wanted a Crown. Uh, it, it's become more of a monarchy all the time. And, and rule by fiat, uh, and it's it's funny until it's horrific. It it was funny. No, it was never funny. It was never ever funny. And it was um, the thing that I'm finding really interesting, though. And I don't know whether this is controversial to say, but it seems as though the Catholic Church is taking over the Supreme Court. It seems as though there seems to be a leaning with Bill Barr and Pompeo and all of those those very conservative Catholics pushing an agenda. And it seems like it's the, it's, it, it, it's like 1600s all over again, where there is going to be a church in charge of our country, or at how, least in charge of our judicial system. How interesting, Jane, because the, the, the cover art on my book is based on a portrait of Henry VIII. I know. And my first poem refers to a church dispensation uh, allowing six different marriages. Uh, it, it, I never made the connection. Well, you have to, in order to have the, the, the have if you have a, a religious nation, you mm -hmm. need to have one of those groups behind you. It's the Russian Orthodox. Um, yep. they, they are with Putin because Putin let them thrive and others Curious, didn't. Curiously, I have not written a funny satirical poem about the Catholic Church. Well, let's, let's do it. Come on. <laughs> Lurch, let's see, sitting on my perch. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, I found that very interesting because, you know, reading your... Um, mm -hmm. and, and then also about this woman that, that he's planning on, on uh, installing in... in um, but it just seems as though religion is, is playing a very funny role in Trump's, yeah, in, well, in Trump's plans. Even yeah. a, a person being as non-religious as Trump, and yet he, he clothes himself in the mantle of, of, of the religious. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's been, uh, the whole last few years have been like, facing a series of freight trains coming right at you, and they're coming faster than ever. Uh, I think James Carville is right. I, I mean, the, the, the frenzy we're, we're experiencing right now is, is our president's desperate fear of being defeated because he yeah. knows he's not yeah. president. Yeah, he, and all of the statements that he's making about, I, I'm not sure I will recognize the election and all of this stuff. Is, is him projecting his fear. Yeah, and he's protected. He's, he's, legally, he's protected by being the president and practically nothing else, so. Yeah, yeah. But I loved, I mean, I, I loved the, disi the dissection of each one of the people who support him in your book. Yeah. Each it's one like, of them had that, that delicious uh, attack that, that they need. You need uh -huh. to point out who these people are. Yeah. Well, Elaine Chow, for instance, uh, was yes, right. just perfect. <laughs> I, uh, when I first set out to write the book, uh, to write the first of the two books, the, the beginning of the whole enterprise, 
I, th I thought of leaving Trump completely out and just writing about the rogues gallery of his appointees uh, because they're, there's, it's, it's endless. I mean, they, they are a yeah. long, long cast of characters who are so bizarre. They're great comic subjects and satirical targets and 80% of them are long gone. They all flamed out because he turns on everyone eventually. Uh, and so I, all my first poems that didn't even mention the word Trump. Uh, and I thought that was my way of getting at him. How frustrated, how mad he'll be that he's not included in this book. And then I found, well, how can you possibly leave it out? It's like leaving out uh, the sun when you're talking about the planets. Would he have paid attention had he not been in? He wouldn't, he would not, he would have ignored the fact that it existed had it not well, had it. So far, he's, he's still ignoring it. I'm waiting for my <laughs> tweet. I want a no tweet. No invitation to the, to the West Wing? No, no, no. I, actually, I have been. I, had a, I got a wonderful in, invitation to a really, really memorable evening. Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan invited me to be the after dinner entertainment at a retreat of the Democratic Senate Caucus in Baltimore in January, just before uh, the coronavirus lockdown. By that oh time, my. I'd written about four or five of the new poems, including uh, a Roger Stone poem, a Jay Seculo poem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I said, yes, I showed up. They were, we had a wonderful evening in the- Oh, the, what fun! The, the Rare Books Library of John Hopkins. And I read the new poems, some of the old poems, but the new poems, the very first people to hear about four or five of these poems read aloud were the Democratic Senate's senators, the sitting oh. Democratic senators. And they gave me a huge standing ovation. They were- was, I bet. I just, I just sent every one of them a copy of the book yesterday. We just shipped them out. So I, I even as in my opening remarks, I said, I, I feel so silly calling you all Senator this and Senator that. Can I call you all by your first name? And they all said, yes. <laughs> That's how I got John Tester involved in the video project. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're eager. I, I you know, I've, I, I performed at the White House once. It was the Clinton administration. Yes, yep, you and me both. Yep, yep. Remember no, this was, the... that was, that was Christmas in Washington. This was actually oh. in, in the White House. Oh, um, that's, that's right, we didn't get to the White House. Right, we... I did a, a show on NPR for 11 years with Buck Henry and Robert Krulwich and Tony Hendra. And it was NPR's 75th anniversary or something, birthday. And so they decided to celebrate NPR at the, at, at the wow. East Room, at the East in Room. Who's, in whose uh, administration? Clinton, uh -huh. Clinton administration. So oh. it was, and, and what we did on our show was we improvised the, the news. We improvised the year's news, the reason uh -huh. why these things happened. So it was not based on any fact. Um, and it was all improvised. So we went there with just an outline of things that we could possibly discuss, but not, not an idea of, of how to fill it in. Um, yeah. And John, we killed. <laughs> we killed. It was awesome. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. So yeah. moments like that are just, oh. Yeah. Well, we had our little moment when the, the cast of Third Rock from the Sun was invited out to host Christmas in Washington. That was uh, stunning. And uh, you remember that we had to rush back to, f to finish an episode and we all got terribly sick. I was There's... the incubator. Yeah, yeah. We arrived and I, we went to that cocktail party and I walked in and I was talking to some people and I looked at Patrick and said, I don't feel good. Oh, God. I had a temperature of 104 and a half. We all flew back to Los Angeles, sick as dogs, to do this, to do the episode where we, where we put on a Shakespeare play in, in the <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. You, you, you'll, all of you listeners, you'll have to forgive us for, for our, we share the most fantastic six years of our lives and we could go on all night telling funny stories about it, but we won't. 
without question the best six years of my uh, life. But anyway, I, so actually, yeah. before before, Professional. We get, before we get back to my book, I want to show. I had a surprise for you, Jane, which I think everybody would enjoy. When we finished our six, year, six years, you may remember this. We were given a yearbook full of photographs from the whole Third Rock experience. And I thought I would surprise you by showing an entire series of photos <laughs> of, of you and me in one scene oh, after another. Isn't that fantastic? Well, John, it, my favorite <laughs> was when we were tied together with pantyhose <laughs> yeah. in the library, and we we had to escape through the for, for yeah, the feeding ducks. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh boy. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Back no. to your book, John. Yes, yes. What do you want to know? I'll tell you. And by the way, Jane Curtin, very shortly, she told me, is going to be the arbiter of all things literary for Symphony Space. In fact, with me, she's just uh, warming up. This is her spring training. So let's my see. My dress how rehearsal. Goes. Yeah. So what do you <laughs> want to know about my, my tome? <laughs> I want to. I, I I want to know. Do they come easily to you? Do the poems? Because poetry, once you get into the rhythm of 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 the poem, it does seem to happen a little quicker than if you are putting if if you, it is if it is not poetry that you're you're doing. You know, you some of them, some of them came very easily, and some of them were agonizingly hard. Uh, I can tell some of them were agonizingly hard and some of them were easy. Well, well the then, ones that were agonizingly hard, John, were the ones that I really just relished so much because you went deep. You went very far into these people and I could see the layers of the concentration that you had to go through in order to get there. Yeah, and it I seems, did. I, it I seems did. to me as though the poetry you can get the you can get the rhythm going and then go back and change the words to to sort of augment it. But there were some that were just so great. Well, the, I, I would do a huge amount of research. I was quite intent that I not be making up anything. Uh, ironically enough, uh, <laughs> the, the if you if you open the book, you people who haven't seen it you'll see that every single poem it has a sort of afterthought, which is a completely deadpan and completely factual mini, mini biography of the person or the event that has been made fun of in the preceding poem. Because I did want it, you know, I wrote that too, but it, it's, it's completely deadpan and serious and, tr and factual. Very factual, yes, Everything I found that really and, interesting. And indeed, in the subject of all the poems, I did a huge amount of research, a uh, huge amount of research. I, I, I got on the internet and just sucked up as much news reporting as I could, and then just tried to refine it. It's the only way you can do it, to sort of distill it. But you take a, uh, something like the Jay Sekulow poem or the Roger Stone poem that I've mentioned, and you'll notice they're just full of little details that yeah. most people did not know. And if you care to, you can go and see exactly what I'm referring to. But the great thing is you use that to, to fit into meter and rhyme and every stanza reaches a punchline. So it's right. fine. Even if you don't, if you're not all that familiar with the actual information that's being conveyed. I found it, I found, I learned a lot of new information from your poems and from, from the little epilogues that you wrote, but um, how long did it take you to do this book? Uh, to do it in, I think, mid-December. Uh, and, and I was very hesitant. The first one was, they are, the simple and short answer to your question is, the poems are very hard and they take very long. Uh, but I said yes, because big, big things were happening. And I had no idea how big. Yeah. I started writing at the beginning of the impeachment hearings. And a lot, shortly thereafter came the coronavirus. And shortly after that came Black Lives Matter. And 
the arc of the book is the history of that period in satirical rhyme. Uh, it, I, I submitted my last poem on April 27th. A couple of days later was June 1st, which is one of the most infamous days of the entire Trump administration. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. That was Lafayette Park and St. John's Church and uh, local uh, state and federal troops clearing out a peaceful demonstration. And it was too late. I couldn't write a poem about it, but I did, I did write an introduction about it. And yeah. the theme of the introduction is satire happens fast. The minute you write about something, the next day it's ancient history. And you miss the chance to, to write about the things that come after your publication dates. Uh, not only did I, I wrote it, I wrote the introduction on that subject, and I also fit in two fabulous illustrations. In fact, I think it's worth showing off my illustration. I, in, the, in the introduction, I refer to it as a scene that would not be out of place in a modern day retelling of the emperor's new clothes. And then <laughs> I, I did a drawing, and I did have a chance to fit this drawing into the book, though no new poem. And there's oh yeah, the <laughs> emperor on his way to St. John's Church. And You'll love that because it makes him look thinner. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and the last, and, uh, and likewise, the entire Black Lives Matter movement, it was impossible to write about it, but I was able to put the very last illustration of the book in at the last moment. That's Dumpty facing off against a great big crowd of demonstrators. And, and that, I, I did that drawing even before the Portland federal troops moved in. Who are we, John? Who are we? <laughs> I know, I know. Well, hopefully we're, very, we're a very different country in a few months. I, mean, I, other... believe, I, I believe we've hit bottom. And I think well, the only way you can rise is to hit bottom. I think this is bottom. Well, good, Jane. I, yeah. I'm, glad I'm an ever the optimist. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to be an optimist or you would kill yourself. Yeah. I, I, um, and when, when I decided to do the book, I was actually working on a TV series and I knew I was going to be working on it all spring. And I thought, I will say yes, because it's that important. And we decided to get it done in time for the run up to the election. Uh, but I, I really despaired of getting it done with. And then I was told, go home, we're suspending production, you have to stay locked in place for the next three months. And voila, I got my book written. So yeah. I'm not sure that qualifies as a silver lining, but I had a project. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think that you are one to sit idly by, John. I, I, I think that, that one of the things when you open the book and there are the swirls of all of these, uh, these little things that you have drawn, that I believe that that's the inside of your head. <laughs> that, oh. You know, there are, there occasionally a vase will go by and maybe a small dog or yes. flowers or a book <laughs> or something. But I, I believe that you are in constant motion. And um, well, I've done nothing during the quarantine. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that's not true, Jane. No, pretty it, much it nothing. Com it comes of a kind of desperation. I, I think it has to do with being an actor and wondering what my next, another job will come along. A, a kind of uh, obsessive need for projects. Yeah. And uh, yeah. if you remember, I remember this very distinctly. I wrote a children's book children's yeah. picture books when I when we were doing third row and I rushed in to show the whole group when it hit the New York Times bestseller list and you looked at me and said oh please <laughs> <laughs> do you remember uh, that <laughs> I do <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know I know I, 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 I understand what you're saying about <laughs> excuse me being an actor because if you, if you decide that you're going to be a working actor, that that's what you're going to be, you don't stop. Yeah. You can't. That, yeah. was your, that was your choice. That was your goal. And, and there are people who are actors who stop. And mm -hmm. I, I find that hard to understand. How can they not have that need 
to at least get that expression out. But you have many ways to express yourself. I mean, you've got music, you've got art, you've got the books, you've got, and you've got acting, which I, I, I am so jealous of. And, and, but it must make you a little nuts, doesn't it? It makes me plenty nuts. Uh, ask yeah. me, uh, my wife. Uh, you know, my wife is a professor. Yes. And she, or she has a very orderly and regimented life. She knows what conferences she'll be going to two years from now. She has had one job. She's been at UCLA for 40 years and only just retired. Yeah. In any one, given one of those 40 years, I've had four, five, or six jobs yes. and worked with that many different cohorts. Yeah. It's a radically different way of living and it does make you, it's a very exciting life, but it's a very nervous making life. But I, but I think about other people. I mean, you know, I think of it's like an academic and when they stop. But don't they need that place to go? Don't they need that, that, you know, that routine that they've established that has become so comfortable? Yeah. And a place, I, I don't know what I would do if I, if, I mean, I've, I'm retired, but I'm not stopping. No, they me. won't let you retire. You're doing <laughs> some wonderful work these days. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it must be said before the, this interview, which appears to be all about me. It I, should I, be about I, you. I, it's I, your I, book. That, that film with Melissa McCarthy and, and, uh, and Richard E. Grant, I, I mean, that was the most wonderful acting. I was so proud of you. And oh, so, thank you, and John. I'm so happy to see you in such a completely different mode. Oh, it, you know, it, it only takes 60 years to break <laughs> out and try something new. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to last this long? It, it's, yeah, it's you know, kind of we're boring. so lucky. Yeah. We're so lucky, John, that, that yeah. we get to do what we love to do. And, and mm, I appreciate it every day. Yeah. Jane, this is so wonderful. <laughs> I wish you were here. I wish you were in my living room. John, I've had another wonderful experience of Third Rock in the last couple of weeks. I've gotten back in touch with Joseph Gordon Levy, uh, Levitt, of course, Joey to us, yeah. who is now a big movie star. He's left us all in the dust. But I invited him to participate in this wonderful video project of the poems, which you're participating in, too. You already mentioned your poem. Uh, it, it, and, and in both cases, my conversation with you and my conversation with him, it just all came rushing back. We just went from one shared memory to another. It was ecstatic. It was we such a glorious experience. And I did a series <clears throat> at Radford that was just canceled. Uh, we only did one, uh, one season. But going back to that, that lot, and mm -hmm. you walking, you know, driving onto the lot, and they, the guy, the, the security guy recognized me, and he went, what are you doing here? <laughs> right, it's <laughs> great. Right. And, and our little plaque, show. our yep. little plaque on our sound said, stage. We <laughs> miss you guys so much. Oh, God, it was wonderful. Lightning in a bottle, and this, and this hour can't go by without us mentioning our dear mutual friends, Bonnie and Terry Bonnie Turner. Bonnie and Terry Turner. Who were the reason that Jane and I are, paired together for eternity in people's yeah. minds. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, great friends and, and who created the show. I love to see, I love to go back and visit Bonnie and Terry. We always end up watching at least one episode of the show. Oh, do you? Really? Oh God, it's such a wonderful, thrilling, guilty pleasure. Well, it's I told you about the, um, uh, uh, I got an email from Bonnie uh, and said that she had watched Tea and Sympathy on Sunday at her house. And I said, I was watching it at the same time. And she said, do you remember that scene you did with Joey? And, and uh, he, was, he was concerned about his sexuality and you were trying to guide him through. Were you doing Deborah Carr? And I went, yes! <laughs> and so Deborah Carr became our spirit animal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> got to parody so many people. <laughs> oh, so much fun. I thought it would be fun, Jane, to invite you to read a poem with me from the book. Would you like to do that? I would love to do it. Let me get okay. my book. Yeah, go get your book. I'll, I'll pick a poem. Um, since you said so, you like the dark ones. I did like the dark ones. I thought it would be fun to read uh, Recipe for Disaster 
Do you remember that one? No, where? It's on page 73. It's, it, it is my, it's my comic take on the coronavirus. Do you remember this one? I, hold on, I think I do. Yes, yes. It, here's the illustration for our listeners and viewers. It's, uh, it's, a, it's Dumpty the chef, sort of like Nero fiddling while Rome burns. He's cooking while coronavirus rages. Uh, this is how to, uh, my attempt at being funny about the cor coronavirus, it's not really funny. Shall I start or you? Oh, you start. It's called Recipe for Disaster. Try a viral new cuisine, COVID-19. Offer it to each civilian, 300 million. It's quick and easy to prepare microbial fare. First preheat an anxious nation with misinformation. Take what other leaders tried and set aside. Place the 50 sovereign states on separate plates. So confusion and distrust make your crust. Insist on sycophantic praise. Stir the pot for all to see on live TV. Antis, simmer low, Cuomo, no. Pound Jay Inslee, call him snake, then pre-bake. Claim it's Gretchen Whitmer's fault, pinch of salt. If the kitchen is a mess, slam the press. If the pastry comes unstuck, pass the buck. Our supplies arriving late, blame the state. Shuck all science-based advice, puree twice. If the stock exchange careens, Boil your greens. For a dash of ignorance, add Mike Pence. Use your clueless son-in-law for the slaw. <laughs> Slash the funds for WHO, knead the dough. Add some spice to this fiasco with Tabasco. Once you learn how it can kill, throw in dill. When a hundred thousand die, bake your pie. When at last the horror's done, Claim you won. Takes national disaster. <laughs> Recipe for disaster from Humpty Dumpty wanted a crown. And incidentally, in those videos that I was talking about, we have Samuel L. Jackson speaking both the first and the last stanzas. <laughs> <laughs> and the likes of John Tester and James Carville taking part. It's oh, fantastic. very <laughs> nice. Anyway, uh, I think we're going to, I think we're going to give people a taste of those two videos before our hour is over. Oh, nice. Did you know that? I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. No. It, it won't be yours. Yours is not completed yet. Oh, no, 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 no. Mine, mine was just, mine was just finished. Just baked. I, I haven't even seen your reading yet. But I know it'll be it's a great. I, I'm so glad you gave me that poem. I'm so glad you gave me that poem. I find her, I find that relationship very interesting. Uh, interesting is the opportunity. The Elaine Chow, the Mitch McConnell relationship is very interesting. And, and uh, I, I think they, they are well suited to each other. Yeah, well, it's worked out just fine for both of them. It has indeed, not for I, the country, but for them. <laughs> I wish them many happy returns. Yeah, go away. <laughs> so, very good now, reading. Are we going to have? Are are there people going to be asking questions? Is that part of the um, I think so. protocol I, on these things? I think we're ready for anything. Uh, Andrea, chime in if you if you have anything for us. Um. Well, okay. I'm coming in. I'm coming in. Okay. <laughs> Wait a sec. Yes. All right. Um, I just have a good time. By we, the way. It, before before you say a word, Andrea, I have to thank you for doing this. Well, uh, thank you. Writer's <laughs> Block is such a great, great thing. And you reminded me before we went live that I was there at the very inception. I, I, I'd forgotten it all, uh, all these years later that that was a Writer's Block event, mainly because hardly anyone came. Yeah. Well, how many people were there? I'm not telling you. That's, oh, that's a on. secret that will go that will that will go with me. But I remember every single program, and 
it was such a great program, but we're just we're just gonna move on. Um, yeah. <laughs> but well, it turns out you don't need anybody at all. Look at the three of us. Absolutely. Um, why don't we show the clips? The okay. yeah. So um, we're gonna show everybody. We're gonna show you on and others reading and it's it's just so fun so hang in there yeah why don't i set that up a little bit for you andrea okay just the fact that things are so different right now for launching a book uh, i just had the the bright idea since i couldn't do book signings and personal appearances that i would collect splendid friends of mine to just read my books and I got in touch with my friend, Tim Van Patten, a marvelous director who enlisted these three really brilliant young guys who've created something called Triptych Productions to make little three and four minute videos that we will dole out right up until the eve of the election. And we, we recite about two thirds or three quarters of the poems in the course of it. We call it the Trumpty Dumpty cycle. We thought that had a nice Wagnerian ring to it. So, <laughs> that, appropriate. Oh, I'll appropriate. say. So after um, we show you these great clips with um, John's friends, I'll come back on and ask some questions that uh, that have come in and a couple that I've uh, you know f dreamed up while listening to you. So uh, so now we're going to show these these wonderful clips. Trumpty Dumpty wanted a crown. Trumpty Dumpty wanted a crown to make certain he never would have to step down. He wanted a robe made of ermine and velvet. The Constitution, he wanted to shelve it. With impeachment awash, his ambition had grown. He wanted an orb, a scepter, a throne, six royal palaces, six royal carriages, a church dispensation for six royal marriages, courtiers installed on his own Supreme Court, and royal beheadings, if only for sport. He craved the occasional royal procession and gasp, the eventual royal succession. Trumpty Dumpty gets his way, unless the public has something to say. If we let him have all of his favorite things, we'll have to endure the divine right of kings. The Tories, or the Tiger King. Take a moment to pity the poor GOP. They're as lost and confused as a party can be. Inspired by their recent calamitous stories, here's a family fable. We'll call it the Tories. Generations had passed, but the Tories endured a Washington family proud and assured their forebears had left them with money and power, Reagan, the Bushes, and Dwight Eisenhower. The family's children were lively and sweet. The corridors rang with their pattering feet. Playing one day near the Capitol Dome, they found a stray kitten and carried him home. For the children, the kitten was fun and exciting in spite of his penchant for scratching and biting. His flushed orange face and his lackluster eyes foreshadowed a life of corruption and lies. But the kids didn't care. They wanted to claim him. They angrily fought about what they should name him. Whiskers or Tabby, Grimalkin or Pie, they settled on Dumpty, though heaven knows why. The parents and grandparents sternly resisted. The children all pouted and loudly insisted. The grown-ups relented, resolving the spat, unaware that they'd adopted a wild tiger cat. With feline ferocity marking his essence, the tiger grew up to a fierce adolescence. Snappish and lumbering, cocky and cruel, the Tories dispatched him to military school. Though in college he managed to pick up some breeding, the cat never bothered with writing or reading. No surprises. In spite of his ivy degree, the brain of a tiger's the size of a pea. Launching himself in the family biz, Dumpty was hailed as a real estate whiz. Though tending to swindle, to cheat, and to bungle, 
The tiger will thrive by the laws of the jungle. His carnivorous hunger for animal pleasures brought him an empire of assets and treasures. Casinos and golf courses, hotels and clubs, three different spouses and five tiger cubs. A reality show was the next on his tray, where his bright orange stripes are on constant display. His brand had transcended mere real estate czar. He was Dumpty the Tiger, a media star. Fame, having stirred Dumpty's feline ambition, he sharpened his claws for a daring new mission. Egged on by the animals held in his thrall, he would campaign for POTUS the following fall. The Tories reacted with horror and shame at the thought of a tiger disgracing their name. Fearing the likes of a dozen Fort Sumters, they formed an alliance of staunch never dumpters. At first, they sought out a political savior to counter their tiger's rapacious behavior. But no matter how stoutly his rivals would strive in primary season, he ate them alive. Dumpty's campaigning was ruthless and shady. His electoral foe was a former first lady, sane and familiar and female at that. She was juicy red meat for a ravenous cat. Having cravenly failed to derail or unhorse him, the Tories were finally forced to endorse him. Despite how he made them all tremble and cower, they decided at last they would ride him to power. Civility, justice, and reason took wing as Dumpty was crowned the Supreme Tiger King. Then, with murderous appetite, savage and hearty, he ate every soul in the Grand Tory party. There's a moral I urge you to never forget to this frightening fable that's not over yet. If you coddle a tiger and venture to ride him, you're certain, dear reader, to end up inside him. So that was fabulous. And um, I would think that you might get an invitation from the White House now because this <laughs> poem, you know, might be seen as a compliment. And uh, the subject, Trumpy Dumpty, might, might find it absolutely, um, you know, I mean, well, you're, you're catering to him. You're playing right into him. So... If you were invited to the Trump White House tomorrow, see, that sounds like the beginning of a limb rule. <laughs> uh, everything does, doesn't it? Everything is a poem now. <laughs> what, um, what poem? I'm setting you up because we want you to read some more, obviously. What, if you were invited to the White House tomorrow, what would you, what would you pick from, from one of my favorite when, books of poetry? I think I would sing them. I would not read them a poem. I would sing them Joe McCarthy's lullaby. Because well, that's for the. I'm ending with Joe McCarthy's lullaby. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I, I'll save it. I'll save it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell you that. What, no, whatever. that's fine. I, I it. See, we think along the same lines. But you know, you've made an interesting point, Andrea. I, I think. <laughs> I think Trump is the embodiment of the old saw, no, all, all publicity is good publicity. I think he would have sulked if I had written that book, these two books and left him out of them. Uh, I think that's the key to why he opened up so completely to Bob Woodward. He thought, oh boy, I am going to be the subject of one of Bob Woodward's historic volumes. And, and he was suckered into completely uh, sabotaging his own uh, presidency and electoral, electoral campaign, just out of pure vanity. His vanity is, in, in a sense, it's, it's the most dominating trait in his entire personality. To but it, it's, it's, what, it, it's what propels him, it's his ego, it's, it's his, his need to, to be out in front. It, yeah. it is the gas in his bag. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and the know, poem that you just read is flattery. I mean, he would find it flattering. Oh, yeah, the, the Tiger King. Yeah, yeah. He, as Van Reck, Donald Jr. sort of fancied himself the Tiger King when he talked about that TV documentary. 
Yeah. Um, they're an amazing crowd. So, so amazing tomorrow, crowd. What, if you're, since, you know, if you're invited to the White House tomorrow and they send you Air Force One or Air Force Two, you know, that mm -hmm. has been disinfected with, um, you know, enough Lysol and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh -huh. what would you... Hydrochloroquine. Yes. <laughs> what, would you, what would you read? Um, oh, God, there are so many choices. Uh, I think Recipe for Disaster, what we just read, is it's the most poisonous, but it's the most to the point. Uh, the, the fact that he has somehow been able to ignore the importance of this virus and the, 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 the hundreds, the now hundreds of thousands of lives it's taken. Uh, I, wouldn't I wouldn't miss the opportunity to read that poem in the Oval Office, in the White House. I, I do have to say, you're being impossibly difficult. I'm trying to get you to run asking you to pick another oh. poem to oh. read. Oh. <laughs> you're so <laughs> obtuse. I mean. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed your, let's see, I should, I should have planned it. Well, why don't I read you, a, I'll read you a couple of very short ones. Short okay. bonbons, because people should know that there, there are a lot of short takes too. Uh, there's there's one called Rabid Rudy. I think oh. that's a, uh, this, and I, I have to show you the illustration to this. It's uh, our our man Rudy Giuliani on a weather vane pointing in the wrong direction. That's Rudy Giuliani as a weather vane. What goes on with Rabid Rudy? Monster of ineptitude, Dumpty's spinning weather vane botched his mission in Ukraine. Mixing bribes and dirty tricks, he soiled our geopolitics. Filled with rage and babbling bluster, America's mayor has lost his luster. That's one of the short ones. Here's another one. This one's called Omoluments, and it has a, a picture of of our <laughs> vice president, Mike Pence, as a leprechaun with his pot of gold. And the title, as you see, is Omoluments. That's Irish for emoluments. <laughs> US airmen making merry on a jaunt at Trump Turnberry. Heads of state at Trump DC buying off the franchisee. Trump proposing Trump Doral cash his hidden rationale. Doonbeg hosting Veep, Mike Pence. Did someone say emoluments? And then I'm going, and then I will read, and then the last of this little trilogy of short pieces, this one's called Cipollone's Finest, uh, Cipollone's Fine Bologna. Mm -hmm. And there's the illustration. This is what Calvin Trillin calls a mono rhyme. Here's another dumpty crony, crafty snake with heart of stony, spouting constitutional baloney from the foot of Dumpty's throny. Up till now, a rank unknowny. Meet Pasquale Cipollone. <laughs> How's that, Andrea? That I, was that was that was good, and thank you for three for, three for the price of one. Three <laughs> for the price of one. Now I have a so so many questions come to mind and. Uh, some people have sent in emails. Um, so flawed individuals make for interesting characters in poetry and fiction and in television and movies. Um, you've played your share of them. Um, was there anybody in particular who was really easy to write about or really impossible to write about? Uh, I would say the easiest poem uh, that the easiest, quickest poem of the entire volume was the Joe McCarthy poem, which people will hear very shortly. Joe McCarthy's lullaby. Uh, nobody was mentioning Joe McCarthy in all this crazy demagogic behavior that was going down in the last 10, 12 months. And it began to, and I, and I was taking it lullaby where Joe McCarthy is singing, and I should include Roy Cohn 
in the picture. Because and I also completely envisioned the illustration. That was at about 8.30 in the morning. And by 11 o'clock, I had finished the poem and I'd finished the drawing. I mean, a lot of these, like, like the D Tiger King, that was like a three day long, all day long poem, agonizing to write. This one, like that. And I think it's because the subject is simply so rich. Trump is doing exactly what Joe McCarthy did. Joe McCarthy failed at this and Trump is succeeding, which makes it both ironic and funny and appalling. Right. So when you're, you know, watching the news or reading the papers, you know, uh, do you stew about it for a while or does it just, or do you just immediately run into the shower and start composing a poem? Uh, <laughs> it, it, again, it, it, it's, I did, so I remember writing, sitting down when I wrote the first book, when I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I, I simply wrote down a sort of data, I created a database of egregious people and appalling moments. And I thought, ah, there's a poem. Yes, there's a poem. Uh, and, you know, there's, good Lord, there's loads and loads. Uh, and, and as I said before, it's very interesting that a lot of the people that I have written about are almost forgotten now. Mm -hmm. They flamed out so early. People who were early on in the first book are really, they're figures of history now and forgotten history at that. Scott Pruitt, Tom Price, Harold Bornstein, Ronnie Jackson. I wrote poems about all of them yeah. and they're all long gone. I mean, I bet a lot of, a lot of people who are watching right now who've forgotten who half those guys are. But Ronnie Jackson is running for office. Yeah, yeah. So some of them come back. They're like, trying. They're trying to be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's head spinning and it's impossible. It's impossible to keep straight. But do you have any favorite villains from either, you know, Dumpty Volume One or this volume? I mean, it, it's so. Well, actually, there was someone I, I, that, I, that I was noticing very early on. And I would say, boy, have you heard about this guy? And I was amazed at how many people had not heard about him yet, but they sure eventually heard about him. And that's Brad Parscale. And I was gonna ask about him, like writing yeah. about these guys that aren't marquee names. And, and, and he lasted a long, long time. And now he's gone. Can, can, out. I, read you, can I read you my poem about him? Yeah. The interesting thing about this is I wrote it before Dumpty tur uh, Trump turned on him and fired him. Or, or, or disappeared. Demoted him. Yeah. yeah. It's called The Invisible Man. And I'll show you my little show and tell. That's, that's his picture in the wings while Dumpty's giving a speech. The Invisible Man. My name is Brad Parscale. I do what I can. I'm Dumpty's essential invisible man. I've been at his side since the very creation, his maestro of media disinformation. I'm the towering Texan who made him the POTUS, yet I constantly strive to escape public notice. My political mantra, I chant by the hour, work in the dark when you're wielding dark power. When Dumpty gears up for another election, my impact is felt like a viral infection. I launch all my strategies, plots, and schemata by harvesting truckloads of voters' raw data then clog up the web with my internet litter on Facebook and Instagram, TikTok and Twitter. Millions are lured by my grand master plan since no one can see the invisible man. When the story is told of King Dumpty's ascendance, my name will appear in the very first sentence. His fiery climb was a walk in the park. He provided the fuel. I provided the spark. When I threw my dust, in America's eye, you couldn't distinguish a fact from a lie. You couldn't distinguish the bad from the good. The invisible man did all that he could. So now what's so very interesting is, look at that poem in retrospect. That was written while he was still high and mighty with the Trump, in Trump world. 
Yeah. I even mentioned viral infection when no coronavirus hadn't even emerged yet. That, that's kind of happy little uh, kind of synchronicity. That's right. And it's also that phrase of when he throws the dust in your eye and you cannot yeah. tell the truth from a lie is that that's what they've perfected. And that's yeah. what Joe McCarthy tried, but he didn't right. have the showmanship yeah. or the panache. He was an yeah. ugly guy. He was a hideous drunk. Yeah. And he was, he was like a real, I mean, the great mystery to me is how, how so many people adore Trump and think he's charismatic and captivating and just exactly what America needs. To me, this is the great, the great dilemma. It's the great it's, mystery of my life. I don't, I just can't understand it. I can't either, and and I found that that um, you know watching watching cable news and 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 shows like this where you see people sitting in front of their bookcases, and I, I, I the thing that I noticed more than anything was the the biography of Grant by Ron Chernow. So I thought, okay, I'm going to get the biography of Grant. It helped me so much during this time. It helped me believe that yes, we can get through this. History has proven that we have been dark places before. But we as a people can survive because we are greater than our problems. We are bigger than that. And, and, and so I, I, I thank you know, the, the, uh, the cable news for introducing me to, to Grant, who, who is saying, it's, it'll be okay. It'll be okay, we'll get through this. Before I, we um, go to the lullaby, um, uh, of Joe McCarthy. I have a question about uh, celebrities weighing in on politics. And uh, I, did you do, did you, did you do this before? I honestly can't remember because who can remember a month ago, you know, now it, it's just, you know, time has lost its meaning, but did you do, uh, you know, satire and political commentary or even yakking um, during previous administrations about politics. It's funny, I've done little little snippets of it, little bits and pieces of my whole career. I, I worked when I was a young actor and had not even gotten an acting job in New York yet. I had a part-time job working at WBAI, the Pacific <laughs> Station, the old freewheeling, left-leaning radio station, doing radio satire, and the last little, uh, little sketch I did on the radio, I, I quit the job, the, the part-time job, because I'd gotten an acting job. But just as I was literally on the way out the door, we came in one morning to do one more day of recording, and it was the morning after the Watergate break-in. Good timing. We quickly cobbled together a five-minute sketch, which was a parody of the old Mission Impossible TV show, in which I was the voice of John Mitchell on <laughs> the radio, over the telephone, instructing one of my operatives on the, how, what, what, how to proceed with the Watergate break-in. And, and it was hilarious. They put it on the news that night. Didn't make much of an impact on the listeners. Watergate didn't kick in for another year. Yeah. You know, which, but I mean, it's a cautionary tale there satirists don't accomplish all that much, but they amuse us, they get our attention, they make us mad, and sometimes they make us vote. Uh, I haven't done a lot, but, but the short answer to your question is, no, I have not done much. I have not been much of, of a political activist. I certainly haven't, to the extent that I am a celebrity, I haven't used my celebrity to get out there and advocate much at all. I've always been a little wary of that, like why should people be paying more attention to me because I'm famous? Mm -hmm. I did go out and stump for Hillary Clinton in 2016. That was the first time I ever did that. And the reason I did it, I just, I was so appalled by the Trump campaign and the possibility of a Trump presidency. I, I said to myself, if he, it's, he's not likely to win, but if he does, I will be so angry at myself for doing nothing. Are, so, are you going to stump for Biden? I, I mean, this is stumping. This is stumping I, for this, Biden. This is, too. this is sort of my version of stumping. Yeah. Okay. You know, I am an entertainer, and I've 
uh, I'm, I'm not known for my politics nearly as much as I am for just delighting people. You know, people know me from Third Rock from the Sun. And we in its way, Third Third Rock from the Sun was very political, but you would never quite know it because it was so subversive. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it was written by a bunch of uh, a bunch of <coughs> crazy liberals. Yeah. Liberals. <laughs> Um, well, I'll never be able to think about Winston Churchill the same again. I mean, he's, oh. he's always, <laughs> he, he, you've embodied him for me forever. But um, why don't we have you sing uh, the Joe McCarthy's lullaby, which is a, a pretty great way to um, inspire and enrage and get people uh, to vote. It also helps you sleep at night. After all, it is a lullaby. It, and back in the East, it's getting to be bedtime. So here's Joe McCarthy's lullaby, and I've already sent it up. But I, I must show you the, the illustration because it's by Joe. There's, there's Uncle Joe, and that's in the background is Roy M. Cohn, and there's Dumpty as a walling infant. And here's the lullaby. Whose dog is that? Right, Janie, is that your dog? No, my Mine. dog doesn't. They're oh. fine. My Got it. kids Got are trying to quiet them down, but. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> this, this will quiet him down. Yeah. Joe McCarthy's lullaby. Hush, little Dumpty, don't you cry. You'll be in dreamland by and by. Harken back many years ago to the time of your uncle joe if you're feeling all alone give a thought to roy m cone if you're cranky be like me copy my demagoguery stoke the nation's tribal schism by attacking socialism Crap on legal jurisdiction by rescinding Flynn's conviction. If you hype the Chinese connection, you'll squeak by in the next election. If your polls are getting low, implicate Joe Scarborough. <laughs> you can win every crucial state by invoking Obama gate. If you're badly trailing Biden, claim you know everything he's hiding. If they call you deeply flawed, keep invoking voter fraud. But if coronavirus spreads, put it all on the governor's heads. If they claim you reacted slow, Place the blame on the WHO. If resistance grows too large, float the bogus deep state charge. If the public feels chagrin, tout hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> if at last you're voted down, you'll still be the sweetest little dumpty in town. So hush. Little Dumpty, don't you cry. You're out of office by and by, by and by, by and by. See, that's such a note of optimism. <laughs> Writer's Lock always tries to, <laughs> to shed some optimism. <laughs> and, I, I, and I hope I've lured everyone to sleep. <laughs> I think I think this that poem like might keep us awake, but um, <laughs> but um, thanks to both of you. Uh, everybody, this book is so incredibly fun and and sort of enchanting. Um, I thank you, Jane. It's such a pleasure. And yeah, John, pleasure was mine. <laughs> and you're our new poet laureate, so <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. Thank you for bringing Jane and me together. It was oh, so, thank so you. much fun. Thank you.
Here's to next yeah, year with a new book about about Biden. Okay. That's right. <laughs> a big white kiss to Joe Biden. <laughs> oh no 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 no! Let's do it on prosecutions. Come on, let's do yeah. it on prosecutions. That's, you're right, because that's more fun. All right, we'll more do that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and see you soon. Thanks, and thank all your readers for tuning in. You bet. And do read this book. It's delicious. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. I'm going to put it right back up on my bookcase, just so you don't forget. <laughs> I'll put it on mine, too, even though we're going to try to make a place for it to fit. So <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye. I'll be, I'm going to leave the meeting now. Me, too. Goodbye, Me too. Jane. Goodbye Janie. Goodbye, That's John. Good. Talk to you again soon. Say hi to Patrick. I will say hi to Mary. I will.